Jensen Reserve. I'm Laura Jensen and this is what I do. I love working with rare breed pigs, especially the Maishan, and I also enjoy doing the cut work and cure work on them as well. All right, so those of you that ask why I do what I do, how did I end up here? Some of it I'm not even sure. I gotta give it to the man upstairs. I didn't come from the meat business. I didn't come from the food business. I came from a mom, wife, that was struggling with their health and needed to find answers. When my daughter and I were both diagnosed with autoimmune disease, we quickly realized that the chickens we were raising held a key to our health. From there, we raised other pigs. Didn't work for us, they were pretty, pretty brutal pigs, actually. They were eating our chickens, they would have eaten us. And on this journey to find better health, I've had all these amazing people that have jumped on board and they've made it clear that they want to support us in what we do. So with that support and caring and kindness, we keep adding more products, we keep growing. Uh, it turns out that I absolutely love working with butcher shop cuts. I love cured meats. Making sausages is something that I really enjoy and get excited about new ones, which sounds really weird, quite honestly. But that's who I am. I'm passionate about what I do. Couldn't be happier doing what I do. And thank you for supporting us and doing it. So what we're going to do today is break down a half hog for a Maishan. We're working with one of the largest Maishans that is known to have hung in the country as far as grow out size or hanging weight, and that's 382 pounds. So these are the tools that I'm going to use to break down a half carcass. What we have here is a six inch boning knife. This is what's called a breaking knife for breaking down a carcass. This is just my steel to keep my knives sharp. This is what I use when I have to cut bone. This is a meat blade from Cabela's on a Sawzall that I think was $45 at Harbor Freight. So I'm going to show you how you can use these things to break down a carcass. Ready? Now what I did on this is instead of getting it an entire half because I could not pick that up, I asked my processor to do what's called a six-way split. So we've got these pieces that are more manageable and for you at home if you're doing it on your kitchen table, this is much more manageable than this. So let's get the plastic off of it and see what we can do. Um, obviously the red, it's a, it's a trade of the Maishan that the red color uh, is something that you find with them. The meat itself uh, is referred to more as steak than it is pork by our customers. So what am I looking for when I pull this back? So this is actually going to be the kappa muscle and, and where my mind instantly goes is okay how can I cut this, I'm going to get this for the ribs, what can I do here, how's my kappa going to be, what am I going to do. So there are options on how you want to cut it and what you want to do with it. I'm just going to show you one. The biggest thing is don't be afraid to jump in. I am self-taught from YouTube when we first started this. So it is not as intimidating as people think that it is. And it's just trial and error. One of the many things I love about working with pork is it all tastes the same when you eat it. So this is gonna be the loin. To date, I have never processed a sow this age. So I'm pretty excited about the loin to see if we get any changes in the look of the chop. All right, so now we've got the loin unwrapped. One of the big questions we get on the Maishan, because they are a lard hog, is what is the fat cap? So then again, this was a three-year-old sow. She was a little overweight when we processed her. So this is what you're looking at here on the fat cap. I'd say that's roughly inch and a half to two inches. You've got a little bit bigger one on the shoulder, or I'd say that's a solid two inches on that, maybe even a little more right here at the peak. All right, but we're gonna make use of that today too. Next up, this will be the belly. So if you haven't heard of the Maishan, they are an up and coming pig breed. They are a standalone breed. They are not a cross of any other breeds that are out there. They are critically endangered with less than 2,000 left in the world. And we are a leader in the nation in the conservation effort here. The Maishans came from China. They have been in the U.S. since the late 80s when 99 were brought over. Whoa, I'm sorry. That's gorgeous. Um, when they were brought over for research studies. So this is actually, I'm gonna cut this out as a, as a skirt steak. That's gonna be pretty amazing right there. And here we have the ham. It's pretty hard for me. Uh, Kaishi, which means first in Chinese, was the first breeding stock that I ever purchased. Uh, when people would come and visit, they'd often feed her eggs through the fence. She was just quite the character. 
large and in charge. I really, really, really like this sow. Uh, but at three years old, she wasn't able to catch or get pregnant. And at the end of the day, I have the opportunity to either cure her and show respect or bury her of old age. And I chose to cure her with respect. Yeah, it's hard. So there is your six way, I guess technically an eight way, the way we cut the belly here. But that's the split that we're working with. So next, we're gonna set up some tubs because we will have some trim and some fat to work with. We'll use all this. Uh, we'll use the skin, even use the tail. We'll use the bones uh, for some projects too. So to start with, I'm actually just gonna get the ham out of the way because we'll come back to that. When we started with the Maison, the genetic pool at that time was very limited. So when we started, although the hams were delicious, they were 12 pound hams. And what that means in terms of charcuterie is you only ended up with three to four pounds of viable meat, which is not all that great. So one of the things that I've been able to do in growing out these pigs at a much larger rate with the new genetics is improve the size of the hams, therefore the value of the prosciutto. So let's see what we have here, 31 pounds. That's impressive. Now, not all that will be prosciutto. We'll get into that later. We'll cut the tail portion out, the H bone, and we'll get in the cure, but that's a very respectable size. What I find the sweet spot in prosciuttos are is in the uh, 22 to 24 pound range. And I can get that easily with the Maison. Uh, we actually make our prosciutto here. I was able to navigate the USDA licensing process so that we are licensed to hang our prosciutto in the old world ways, and it's hanging in our barn and in our store. We age all of our prosciuttos here for 10,000 hours or 400 days, although I like to push them more to really about the 18 month mark. There's actually nowhere else in the country that you'll find certified Maison pork prosciutto other than Jensen Reserve. A lot of times when you're working and breaking down carcasses, you can work with natural seams. And that's what I'm doing here. We've got a natural seam that we can work and get down to the secreto. Secreto is what this skirt is called. It's considered a secret amongst the butchers. It's not something that you're gonna be able to get at the grocery store. Um, well, I guess technically you can, but you're never gonna be able to just ask for this in raw pork. Typically it's left attached to the belly for bacon. So that's where it goes most of the time. As far as the knives, this is just a Victor Knox, just a basic, nothing fancy, 1995 knife kind of off of Amazon. When I checked around with other butchers and my processor, this is what they use uh, and they highly suggested it. Now one of the other knives that we'll be using today is our breaking knife and it's called a breaking knife because it's designed to actually break down the, the carcass on the hole. But for finer work, I always prefer these little guys. All right, so here we are getting into some ribs here. Uh, I always say don't be afraid to feel around, see what you're getting into. These are these little finger bones here on the ends of the ribs. You don't see those when you get stuff from the grocery store. The difference in the cuts and what you see here versus what you're gonna get at the grocery store or what you typically get from your processor is this is considered primals uh, and, and the split being that we've got it in sections. So essentially we're working in three sections, one being the ham, this would be the middle section, and then this would be the shoulder. There's different versions of it. Um, I would highly recommend that if you can't get your, cows are pretty hard to do, but if you can't get your pig into the, to the processor, that you look at doing something like this because you can get in faster a lot of times. This doesn't require their cut table, and that's what you're actually paying for time when you get something from them cut and wrapped. I think a lot of butcher work is simply, how do you like it? And a lot of people are kind of afraid to jump in, but you never know unless you try. Some of it's gonna take time. The things that I cure um, are gonna take anywhere from uh, three months up to two years, actually, by the time we do the prosciutto. Um, as far as what I'll put in the store, quite honestly, I'm not sure yet. I'll tell you, this cut right here should go in the store, and I've got a, a bunch of people that would love to have it, but I don't know. It might go to the house. <laughs> this is definitely something where we've put a lot of time in. So there you go. There's your, a pork 
secreto or skirt and you've got some other little pieces here that we can clean up. I don't usually spend a whole lot of time doing the cleanup work as far as like packaging something like ready for retail right here because it's important to get the carcass worked. So there's your first cut there. We'll put it in our tub here. Usually a lot of times my husband and I will get in here and uh, get it knocked out. You just kind of learn what the next step is and you just work to keep it going. So this is just as simple as following again some seams here on the ribs. Just gonna knock those out. We're not gonna be making bacon with this one so I'm not really that concerned about what we take from the belly. Um, again we'll clean these up. This will come off of it. That will come off of it and then those probably will Go in the store. All right, so now we've got to make a decision on the belly and what we're doing. So there you go. What is it they say? Real bacon has nipples. So we can go with pancetta here, which is a, um, a rolled and seasoned pork, which may be the direction to go. This needs to all come off here. We don't need that. So let's start the arduous task of getting the skin off. A lot of people don't reuse the skin. We do. Uh, we turn this into pork rinds in the store and we can get into that. Uh, it takes a little bit of time because we're dehydrating the skin and that takes several days to get that done. Uh, the extra fat that you see here, if we don't end up using it in a grind, which generally on a lard hog you have more fat than you may want for that. So we will render that and use that to uh, fry those pork rinds with. So cutting the skin, one thing that we've learned about the Maison is that the skin is actually tougher than other breeds of pigs. So you wanna make sure you got a sharp knife. If you notice, I'm not even really trying to cut the skin, I'm trying to get under it and just get it separated. Uh, the first thing they're going to notice is that it's not that other white meat. That pork really does have color. Well-raised animals definitely have a better color to them. Uh, the flavor, it's actually going to have flavor. One of the number one things we hear is that when you go to the grocery store and you get those cuts, they don't taste like anything. But when you buy from us, your meat has flavor again. And the Maison is certainly no slouch when it comes to that. So if you notice in cutting, I'm keeping my hand behind the knife, not in front of the knife, because you most certainly don't want the knife to slip and cut you. Let me turn it and push away. The Maison has soft fat. You're gonna find like if this was a Duroc, for example, it's not gonna be as soft as this is. If you notice that my knife is just kind of gliding right through it, you don't have that in a lot of the fast growing pigs out there. Now you will see some of it in um, like a guinea hog, but you're not gonna see it to the same, same extent that you do with the Maison. So uh, what we find that most farms are working with is um, around the 10 to 12 month mark. So this one again, this was a sow that didn't catch and it was just her time uh, as far as to move her on. Um, typically, I'd say 10 to 12 months, depending on your feed plan. Uh, feed plans vary. You don't want to watch feeding them fiber and too much fat. Um, we could have had a lot bigger fat cap if she was on a fatty diet. She was just eating a lot. So here we have the skin. Am I perfect? Nope, sure aren't. We can get some of this cleaned up. We can put it into sausage or pepperoni. But to me, uh, you know, I don't do this every day. I don't mind doing it from time to time, but you don't have to be perfect. This is all part of don't be afraid to jump in. Jason's here today reminded me not to be afraid to jump in to YouTube. That's right. <laughs> so, all right, so on this, we will come back to this when we go back through our cuts. But again, so we've skinned the belly and that's going to go in our tub over here for later work. These cuts here, same thing. They're gonna go into some sort of something, be it pepperoni, sausage, something like that. Um, let's clean this up real quick. This is just a gland here. 
that I just don't like the color of it. Uh, if it doesn't look like something I want to eat, I'm not going to feed it to my customers. So, what have I got left here? Yep, packed it up a little bit. That's all right. We can still use it. What I'm cleaning off here is this belly fat here. Very common on the Maisons to have that. We don't need, we don't even need all this. It will either go into a sausage, like a grind, or we'll render it out for, um, or we'll fry other things in. Okay, so what can we do with this? Again, I can take it and turn it into pancetta. I'm not in love with the look. That's what you see here. I'm tempted, quite honestly, to take the other half and do that with it. We can cure it into some bacon. I just don't really have the cooler space right now to do that. This pig was just hauled on Sunday. It was uh, processed on Monday. We picked it up this morning and here it is on my cup table. It'll be packaged for retail tomorrow uh, and be sold by the weekend. So pretty fresh. Okay, so what you're looking at is a Sawzall. So there are certain things that when we cut a carcass, it is better to let the Sawzall do it than a hand saw. When we started, we were using the good old hacksaw bone saw type thing, and that'll wear you out in a heartbeat. So our kitchen is small. We don't have room for a band saw here. So the next best thing was the meat blade from Cabela's and a $45 Sawzall from Harbor Freight. So let me get it seated in here, and then I'll show you what we're doing. So the question came up on, you know, kind of why do we cut and how do we cut? You've got to remember that we came at this from a retail perspective. So what we do is going to go in the retail store um, and it's always important for us to have a good cut for the customer. Uh, the Sawzall does not make the cleanest cut. Uh, I'll show you what it does and we'll still be able to sell some things, but it's definitely not as clean as a bandsaw. So where I'm going to start and what I need to do is cut right through here so that I can get these ribs out. And I'm going to come on down one step forth further and go ahead and cut through the shoulder blade. That's another one that's a beast to cut through. I really don't like that cut. It jars my teeth, but it must be done. Um, so if you were looking for a Boston butt, this is where you would get it actually from a pig. Because we don't have a Sawzall, I don't have the ability to cut a clean Boston butt, and I use this for curing work, so that's why we kind of do the charcuterie cut on these pigs. So. over to the breaking knife now so we can get some more depth on it. Let's go ahead and get these two separated. All right, there's that. Yep, this is where the head would connect. And since I knew this sow pretty well, I asked not to bring the head back. <laughs> All right, so we'll start on the lower shoulder first. We're gonna let me show you bring it around here so you can see it. So this is gonna be a lot of trim, a lot of fat, and then we'll cut these ribs out here as well. So see where we talked about natural seams? There you go. Because essentially what we want from this is trim and skin. So it's just a matter of picking a corner, jumping in, and getting it off of there. notice I'm pulling back against the knife not keeping my hand in front of it but behind it gives and giving me some leverage to work the skin temperature wise what am I looking for 
really when you're working meat, the colder it is, the better off you are. In terms of food code, we're given roughly a four hour window that we have to work within. So if meat is gonna be over 41 degrees, 74 degrees in here right now, so it will be over that, we've got four hours to have this meat worked and under refrigeration. Uh, in terms of cutting, the reason that you want the temperature to be cooler is you're gonna get cleaner cuts if the carcass is cooler. The hot, hotter it gets, the greasier it's gonna get and the harder it is to get cuts. A lot of people ask if we do our own slaughter here. And a lot of times what they're really asking is that do you do all the carcass work here? Uh, legally, I cannot do slaughter here. And that's two things. That's my zoning, which is really okay. And then that's the kitchen licensing. We actually use a federal level processor so that we can ship our final products across state lines if we choose. Um, and then the other reason is I sent this pig on the trailer on Sunday. They did the slaughter on Monday and here it is back here by Wednesday. Where that can be helpful to you is that to me, the slaughter part is the dirtiest, nastiest part. So at my processor, I love them to death. They're amazing people. For $65, they will do a scald, scrape, and split. In other words, they're gonna do the dirty work and then I can do the clean work. So for that, it's not worth me trying to figure out how to, how to build a scald pit and all those sort of things. This is the, the front hook would be right here. Okay. So this is your front shank and then this is the lower shoulder. So again, this is not really glorious work. It's nothing fancy. Uh, this is what I use to make pepperoni. So I'm just trying to get it in a form for it to go through my grinder. Ooh, look at that red. Dang. And we'll turn this into something else. So what is this that you're looking at now? Because I know as you go, things kind of change and you're like, wait a minute, what is this? So this is actually the lower shoulder. So the shoulder would be here, the hoof would be here. Uh, I turn it into pepperoni, but not everybody wants to do that. So what else could you do with it? You've got several options, depending on which direction you want to go with the carcass. You could go with sausage or ground pork, or you could go with a shoulder roast and a front shank, like this would be for beans or something of that nature. So it just depends on what works for you. So what does it take to make pepperoni if you wanted to make it? It's not all that hard. It does involve curing salts and grams and weighing some things out. And if that doesn't intimidate you, which it shouldn't, uh, you can turn this into pepperoni pretty easy. The time it takes for me to make pepperoni kind of depends on what direction I'm taking it. Right now I'm working on more of hard pepperonis. That takes me roughly 60 days once I start something in the cure. So the first thing that has to happen when you make pepperoni, you have to let the, the mixture ferment. Most people don't know that, but pepperoni is actually a fermented product. And once it ferments, then you can start the drying process. We dry age our charcuterie here. We have a special cooler that it goes in and hangs until it reaches a certain moisture loss. And then we hang them in our store to harden. And from there, we vacuum seal them for usually a couple weeks and put them at a, essentially a shelf, just so they're at room temperature. And after that, they become pepperoni from the store. So not a short process, but a lot of fun. We run a couple different coolers here. Uh, and as far as temperatures, and it's a great time to talk about temperatures because July is really smoking hot. So we're always required under food code to maintain refrigeration below 41 degrees or at 41 degrees, but never over 41 degrees. Um, the curing chamber sometimes will run a little more than that, uh, maybe 42, 43, but we would never have fresh meats in there, so. All right, so here we've got the top of the shoulder. This is your spine here. This is the kappa muscle, also known as the money muscle. Here's your fat cap. So if this were the pig, this is the top of her shoulder right here. Uh, if you want to see what I cut earlier, there is what a sawzall will do for you. It is a relatively clean cut but you see that you do get a lot of little bone residue there. 
I know some people don't like bone residue on their meat. I haven't really seen a big difference in it for what we do in the store. I just got to go back to what you like personally. So then one more neat feature here. This is going to be the start of your, your loin here that's going to pick up with your, your chops down here. So let's see if we can get the kappa out of this and get this broke down. So one thing I like about these knives, I'll use pressure against the bone frequently so that I know where I am or where I'm not at. And these knives give good flex. So you're gonna know where you are. Also get good length on it. This is what's considered the chine. Let me see if I can give you a little bit different view of it here. You can actually take that off of it. And that's a that's a usable meat by the way. And then you've got you can feel it. They don't continue all the way down here, but we've got them to here, here, and of course up to here. So let's keep going. Up in there. Okay, did a pretty good job getting that off of there. This is what we're after, this right here. We'll just do a little cleanup on that. Let's get it back around here. Again, natural seam. It's always a good idea to start with that because you can always trim down past it if you want to, but it gives you just a good starting place. So this muscle or the kappa muscle I will cure it into capicola, which is another cured meat. Uh, the kappa is a seven muscle group deal, and each one I personally think brings its own amazing flavor to the table. So it's really fun to work with. The shoulder blade, remember we talked about that being in the way? That's your shoulder blade there, but we do have it cut so we know that. it's out of the way. Okay, so there we go. That's the shoulder blade. The rest of this is going to become the same as what the front shoulder did. We'll skin it, we'll put this into grind, and then we'll render the fat. So let's see what we've got on the copper here. What we want to do is clean that up a little bit. You definitely don't want to run your knife across the table. We definitely want to square up the end there to do that, I try to hold it tight. Do as long a smooth cut as you can. I have to say that I think that an older sow actually is a redder meat, which I wasn't expecting. Can't wait to see what the chops look like. All right, so I'll trim a little bit of the fat off just cause we don't need that in the cure. But this is what I will cure into Capicola. One kappa. All right, again, look for a seam, reach in there, get the best that you can. Don't put your hand in front of the knife, and you won't do it often if you do. And after you heal, you'll remember not to do that. We, uh, we let it fly because customers like that. I do not like that. I personally think it's kind of nasty. <laughs> but the customers um, will sometimes select those bags. How about that? Pork rinds is something that we do very unique here. Most of the times when you are buying pork rinds, they are coming from commodity pigs, commodity blanks as they're called. That's not something that I want to eat or be a part of quite honestly. So we, we had to reverse engineer the process to use our own skins because a lot of the big names that you're seeing or most names that you see out there making pork rinds they're they're using that pork that's just not what I want to do here so uh, it took us a long time to figure out the process we probably spent eight months to a year trying to get the uh, the dehydration right and the frying right and gosh the fryers we went through and blood sweat and tears is an understatement on making pork rinds 
It's definitely a lot easier if we'd have just went with the blanks and got some oil and did it like everybody else, but alas, that is not who we are. So if we're looking at a volume of pork rinds and what we would get from this section, typically when you're dehydrating things, you're gonna end up with 50% loss in the dehydration process. So if you look at this is the amount of skin that you start with, then you're gonna go down to here once you're dehydrated, then you're gonna end up with a bunch of quarter size sections. So I would say you maybe end up with three bags of our large bags of pork rinds at the end of the day. Okay, so there's the skin off of this. The only other thing I really need out of it is the bone, and that's what I'm going after now. We're cutting meat off the shoulder blade. These bones generally either go to our dogs or they go to uh, our red sauce so that we make a broth, kind of bone broth soup kind of thing with them. Or we also provide some of our scraps to the Yellow River Wildlife Sanctuary so they won't be wasted they'll either at the very least feed another animal or they'll feed us again our grinder is a one and three quarter horsepower cabela carnivore it is quite the beast and what i know about it is that it likes long strips i'm gonna cut these into strips in which my grinder is happy while i'm right here you may be asking why didn't i do this with the other cuts and I'll have to go back and do it for the sake of the video. I don't know that there's a, there's that it's necessary for me to stand here doing this in the video. But just to show you how we cut it for my grinder, that's how it is. Uh, this is your pork chops. This is your loin. So on this one, I'm going to use the dreaded saws all that jars my teeth so that we can get pork chops. And I'll show you how we get those. On the other half, I'd actually like to cut the loin out so that we can have lonzina, which is another cut that I like to cure. So, depth of pork chops. You can go really where you want to go, but what we find with the Sawzall and the way that it grabs things, you're better off if you go to about an inch on the chops. Am I going to measure it out with a ruler? No, I'm not. Uh, we'll just, if when we're done and we get ready to package them, we will find two that look alike and put them together. So, one more time. pushing down and it pushes down and then it'll give and once it gives that means that we've gone through the bone and there's no need to keep going I'm gonna go back through with a knife and make sure they're cut through worst case I'll have to get the uh, the mallet out with the uh, cleaver and we'll fix it one reason that I know that it's getting warm in here and that the meats at a higher temperature do you see how this is slightly gooey it should be cleaner and that's from the sawzall and the bone but it's because the temperature and it's making the meat slightly muddy is it bad is it dangerous is it wrong i don't think so i think that we'll be able to work it out just fine but just so you know what you're looking at there so all right here we go let's get the rest of them done okay so why did i stop and why am i standing here staring at it so we've got chops cut here and then I remembered that when I use the Sawzall that the tenderloin gets kind of chewed up from it. So the tenderloin is right here. That's this piece right here. So uh, a lot of people know that as kind of the prime or the premium. And it's a shame that it ends up getting ground because it got chewed up by the Sawzall. So I'm going to work on removing the tenderloin whole and then probably pull out the rest of the loin to use probably in a cure. So what am I doing? Again, I'm pushing up against the backbone here so that I'm giving myself as much room as I can and getting the tenderloin out of here. I'm gonna come all the way down, check where I am there. Cutting across the bone, probably not the best plan. Y'all, you gotta remember that I am very much self-taught. I do what I like and I do what looks good and it seems to work well for my customers. When I first started this, I had a well-meaning retired chef tell me that unless I went to Atlanta and took lessons from a certain butcher, that I would never be able to figure these things out. And the reality is the fact that I do it the way that I like and what looks good, it actually speaks to my customers 
and has been a better fit for me in the end. So again, don't be intimidated about what others think you should do. So here we are working the seam, pulling it out, and there is your whole tenderloin. Now, is that what it looks like when you get it? Nope. So what am I doing different? So this is considered silver skin, so we'll remove that and then we'll clean up this fat on it here. So we'll do that uh, in just a minute and show you what that looks like, but I'd be good with some biscuits. Let's make sure that I'm fully cut through here. And I am. Notice I always pick the skin up off the table. It goes back to you really don't want to dull the blade of your knife on the table. So let's cut these out. In general, you're going to have the same stuff. You know, obviously a pig is a pig is a pig, but they are going to be made a little bit different. I'm going to go back to what I had talked about earlier on the hams. Those Maishans, for example, the hanging weights, the hanging weights on my first Maishans were 164 pounds. It wasn't really anything to write home about. The hams were small, the chops were super small, there just wasn't a lot to work with. So now that I'm looking at a 382 pound hanging weight hog, we've got a lot more to do. So yeah, everything is going to be bigger, but you'll find that, um, you know, the loin size will vary and the fat cap will vary quite a bit. So this started with the whole loin, still got the skin on. I'll end up taking that and saving that as well. This is where I cut with the Sawzall. And these were what we were looking in between before. So all I'm doing, taking my knife, cutting through it. This is whatever you like. We have some customers with the Maison that love the fatty pork chops. We've got some customers that don't like the fat and that's just, you know, they're probably not going to eat a lot of fat regardless. When you buy grocery store pork chops, the fat there is just nasty. It's chewy, flavorless, and nothing that you want to eat. You actually find that the Maison is something that you would want to eat. It does have flavor and you are going to enjoy it. I personally think that because these pigs are raised on pasture, that you're going to be more likely to get more vitamin D in your diet than something that was raised in a, in a building somewhere. All right, y'all, so we were just looking at the chops that I just cut. So what I did is go ahead and take the fat cap off. That will be something that will render into something else. We've got the skin that will turn into pork rinds, and then we have the chops that I cut from that. So I know that the question came up as far as what does pasture raised mean? So for me, my pigs uh, live outside. They are on pasture. They are not locked in a shed at any time and they are free to live as natural a life as they possibly could. Now you may not know this but if you're going to a big box chain and getting pork that that pork there's a 99 percent chance that that pig never lived outside. It lived in a barn or a shed its entire life and didn't get to eat grass and feel the sunshine. So we believe in, in the most natural life possible. And this is one way that we can, we can do that, pasture raised. So then you're probably gonna ask, what am I doing? I'm just cleaning them up. So what do you think? When I'm cutting these, I do try to work with the curve of the meat as far as the loin. This one I'm gonna cut a little bit of that meat off. Is my pork organic? Well, that really depends on your definition of organic. In my world of legalities, organic means that it is certified organic. And in the meat production, it's unrealistic to be certified organic. The feed that we would have to feed would be quadruple the price of a conventional feed. And that would make the pork match. And most people simply can't afford it, so there's no market for it. One other thing about organic feed that I've recently learned is that most of it comes from China. So you're going to end up with some potential contaminations because of the differences in practices that may not be as organic as you would like. So some customers say that we are organic and I appreciate it because they acknowledge the way that I choose to raise the pigs. But are we certified organic? No. Will we be? Not unless something drastically changes. I won't even use Roundup here. 
So we've lived here for seven years. The first year we were here, we came from the suburbs and that's how you control weeds. So we did put Roundup out then. And then as our health deteriorated, deteriorated and we learned about how to eat better, we found that Roundup is probably something we don't want to be eating. So for the last six years, we've been Roundup free. If you come onto my property, you can see by my fence lines, we won't use Roundup. There's actually grass growing on the fence lines. It's not clean, it's not dirt, and I'm gonna keep it that way. So this is the rest of the loin and I'm just quite honestly I'm just poking around kind of little surveillance figuring where I want to be so this is the part that I want to save this is the other end of the loin we do have that chine again right here back here so we're not going to be able to just snip snip and have it out and then if you look down here we've got a fair amount of meat down here that we want to be able to work with too so i'm going to do like i said before we're going to find a natural seam which is right here uh, let's start cutting let's we'll see what we can do i'm going to cut this a little into the fat as you see here because i can always go back and clean it but as i'm cutting it loose here i would rather have extra fat then to cut into some muscle that maybe I could use for something else. And still got some there. Let's see. I didn't get a lot of it. This, by the way, if you if you want to do something different with it, this would make some fantastic fat back. So if you wanted to just take this entire piece. And I, you know, I guess we could if you guys want to see that. It's really simple. I grew up in the country and fatback is what Granny always used to cook uh, with her either inner beans or she'd make it for, for a snack for me. So fatback is literally fat that has been cured with salt and then you fry it like you do bacon and it becomes crispy and it's the most amazing thing. So we have some customers that request this um, in fatback because they say that the new hogs or the commodity hogs don't taste as good as what these do. So yeah, so y'all can see what that is. We'll, we'll make fat back. So again, working on getting uh, the, the loin out of here. So that's what I'm looking at. I think my breaking knife is gonna be a little too big. Let's take this again. You see where I can push up against the bone there? And let's just come on down because that's gonna be some cartilage and stuff all the way down and see see if we can get it worked out of here huh so the cartilage stops right about here and then you're into soft here back up to cartilage here all right let's come around back here see what we can get out here So I'm pulling back a little bit here as I'm cutting and you can kind of see it when it lets go. So what I'm doing now, again pushing back on that, and now we're coming out the other side. So know where we started on this end, now we're down here. Let's see what we look like over here. So pushing against the bone. Pulling down, and we are slowly but surely cutting it loose. This is what we're looking at here as far as this is the loin, so you can kind of see how it goes there. So what I want is this piece right here, and I'm going to cure this into the Lanzino, which is a delicious cured pork loin. Might as well go ahead and clean it up while I'm here. Square off the end. I think a lot of people don't realize that there is a lot of trim that comes from things just like this because we like our cuts when we get them in the bags you know nice and pretty all right y'all that completes the first half of the 382 pound hanging weight mason i appreciate you guys hanging with me don't be afraid to try it yourself or reach out and ask me any questions you have about them you can find us on instagram and facebook under jensen reserve farm or jensen reserve you can also look up Mayshon Preservation on Facebook as well. 
We have a web page if you'd like to check that out and an email list that you can sign up for as well. Right now, most of our products are only available at our farm store that is open six days a week. Give us a try.